thank you very much for the introduction and for uh, letting us be part of this tutorial series. Um, and also thanks to everyone online for coming. Um, I'd like to start us off just giving a brief overview of what AMRX is and the sort of applications that people have made using it. Um, this is kind of our one slide overview of AMRX and we'll be going into more detail about all of this later, so don't worry. But basically AMRX is a software framework for building massively parallel block structured adaptive mesh refinement applications. Um, it's written in modern C++ and there are also Fortran interfaces. So if you want to write your application in Fortran and then it'll call C++ AMRX functions under the hood, you can do that. And there's also, thanks to a recent effort led by Axel Hoibold, um, in the accelerator division here at LBNL, there's also Python interfaces for calling AMRX as well. So you can integrate it with you know, AI and ML workflows and things like that. Um, AMRX applications can run on machines ranging from laptops to supercomputers. So in block structured AMR, you have discretizations that look sort of like this. So the solutions defined on a hierarchy of levels, each of which is composed of a union of logically rectangular patches. Um, AMRX provides distributed containers for mesh and particle data. We also provide GPU optimized parallel communication functions, as well as functions for doing uh, domain decomposition and load balancing. Uh, the kinds of multi-level synchronization operations you need to do when doing AMR, such as tagging cells for refinement and regrading are also provided. We have support for complex geometry via embedded boundaries. We provide both native geometric multi-grid solvers, uh, plus interfaces to other math libraries like Hyper and Petsy. Most relevantly to this series, I guess, AMRX comes with a performance portability layer that supports multiple types of GPU backends, CUDA, and Sickle, and also OpenMP for uh, CPU runs. Um, and we are ex-SDK compliant. We're part of E4S. You can install AMRX with SPAC, and shortly AMRX will be part of the High Performance Software Foundation that will be announced in a few months. Uh, finally, everything about AMRX is open source, so you can go to our GitHub page and get our source code or look at our documentation, since there's a large set of tutorials online as well. So what I'd like to do now is just describe more, more about what block structure AMR is, but by way of kind of setting the stage, it's just an observation that most of the problems we want to use simulation to solve today are pretty complicated. Uh, there's several different physical processes that are coupled together and they each have, will have their own different you know, characteristics, spatial and temporal scales. Um, additionally, it's not enough to have your code work on just one type of architecture anymore. Ideally, you'd want to be able to write one code base and have it run on a bunch of different platforms. And that's kind of one of the advantages of using a library like AMRX is that you can build your applications without having to like resolve some of these problems. Um, an example of the different kind of scales at work, this is an image from the ExaWind ECD project, um, but it's basically, this is everything that goes into modeling a wind farm. <laughs> so you have you know, scales ranging from like the meter scale to model the flow around the individual turbines, going up to like regional and even like global scale atmospheric simulations that all need to be kind of coupled together. So that's the sort of thing that we're talking about. Um, additionally, so, you know, not all simulations use a mesh as part of their discretization, but if you're going to use a mesh, you usually have to make a choice between structured versus unstructured grids. Structured is the type of grid that AMRX is designed to support. Um, and note, neither one of these is better than the other, but they have kind of different applications. So for structured, it's easier to write discretizations. The data access patterns are simpler. And it's easier to get high order accuracy, um, provided you're away from the boundaries. If you're doing something to represent complex geometry and structured grids, you usually have to do more work to maintain accuracy at the boundaries, however. Unstructured grids, on the other hand, you can fit the mesh to pretty much inner, any geometry, and it's easier to get uh, the accuracy that you want there, but then there's more bookkeeping that you have to do in terms of finding what cells are connected to what other cells, and the geometry generation itself is can be time-consuming. Um, and both of these types of meshes can be made dynamically adaptive. Um, so this is by this is just an illustration of, I guess, the fact that each of these has its own application. But this is again from the ExaWind project. 
But what they took an approach is they actually had an unstructured code that modeled the flow of wind around individual turbines. And then that was coupled to a solver based on AMRX called AMR Wind that had a bunch of these kind of subgrid turbines and modeled like wind farms at kind of the kilometer scale. So kind of different, different discretizations for different applications. So even within structured grid plan, there's a way to do a kind of activity that is, is involves mapping or deforming the grid so that basically the cell spacing, even in structured grids, the cell spacing doesn't have to be the same um, from place to place. So you can have stretched grids that look something like here on the bottom, mm -hmm. on the bottom left. Um, and AMRX supports this kind of thing. You can fit, you know, simple kinds of boundary conditions using this approach, but you have to do something extra to maintain accuracy. And the reason for that is, you know, if you construct like kind of a center difference approximation of the gradient, uh, for example, and you like work out what the discretization error would be, you see there's this term that's first order, but it depends on the difference between the cell spacing to your right and to your left. So if you have a uniform cell spacing, that term cancels out and you kind of automatically get this second order uh, accuracy. So that's kind of an advantage of using uniform cell sizes with structured, structured meshes. So in some ways, anyway, doing adaptive mesh refinement with structured grids is kind of the best of both worlds, right? You can have a uniform cell spacing on each level, but then you can have a hierarchy of different levels that kind of make the mesh finer in regions of interest. And so this allows local regularity with all the advantages that come from that. Um, and it also, you only have to do something special at this sort of course fine boundaries. And so this, but this only requires a small fraction of the bookkeeping cost of unstructured grids. And then finally, one more distinction, there's sort of two different styles of mesh refinement that are in the structured grid space. So you can have block structured mesh refinement, which is what AMRX does, this picture on the left, um, or you can have tree-based mesh refinement. And an example of, of a code or framework that does that is flash, flash code. Um, but there you're kind of uh, using a tree structure like this to keep track of the different levels of refinement. Whereas in AMRX, um, we're breaking the domain into these logically rectangular grids or patches and organizing them by level. Um, so finally, one more thing to say about time stepping. So if you're gonna have multiple levels of refinement, there's kind of a choice to be made about whether you want to sub-cycle or not in time. So basically, do you want to advance all the levels with the same time step, which would then be limited by the finest resolution? Um, or do you want to subcycle in time, which lets you take bigger time steps on the coarser levels? So if you're going to subcycle, uh, you're usually going to have to do work to synchronize the different levels. And this can make the algorithms more complicated. Uh, but again, uh, you can take bigger time steps on the course levels. So AMRX supports both of these approaches, and there's examples of applications using both of these productively. So now I want to give a little bit of an overview of the sort of kinds of applications people have built using AMRX. So one observation, I guess, is they span a pretty wide range of different scientific disciplines. Um, a lot of these are like fluid solvers, but even there you have applications to astrophysics, applications to combustion, um, atmospheric science, ocean modeling, et cetera. There's also a bunch of codes for doing uh, plasma physics. And finally, codes for doing kind of less traditional AMR, you know, less traditional applications, such as biological cell modeling or uh, agent-based simulations for epidemiology. Um, and another point I want to make here is that the codes that I've highlighted in blue are uh, were part of ECP application development projects. And so for these codes, AMRX, among other things, was the way that these codes achieved performance portability. And it let them run on machines like uh, Perlmutter or Frontier um, or on CPU-only platforms with, you know, without really having to make, without having to maintain multiple code bases for that. 
I want to highlight one ECP project in particular. So this is from the WARPX code. So WARPX is a, an electromagnetic particle and cell code for doing particle accelerator modeling. And uh, the challenge problem was for doing plasma-based particle accelerators. And this is a sort of part of a simulation of that. So you have a laser that's propagating through a plasma, and it creates this weight field structure behind it. And then you have an accelerated particle beam that's kind of riding along in the weight created by this laser pulse. And so the idea is to chain a whole bunch of stage, stages like this together and then model what happens to the beam as it gets accelerated to higher and higher energies. Um, and we've, so using this as kind of our test problem, uh, WarpX was able to demonstrate, you know, good weak scaling um, on all of Frontier, Fugaku, Summit, and Perlmutter. Um, without really making changes to the code base. There were a few changes that needed to be made for Fugaku to get the auto vectorization to work well, but we're working on upstreaming those into both WarpX and AMRX. But essentially, it's the same code running on all these different platforms which have different you know, GPU architectures on them. Um, another point is that, you know, as part of an ECP, we had, or WarpX had to define this figure of merit uh, and then track its performance over time. So you can see from the start of the project to the end of ECP, there was uh, about a 500x improvement in this figure of merit as we you know, first ported the original warp code to use AMRX and then ported that to GPUs and this gradually made optimizations over time. Um, and also WarpX was the recipient of the Gordon Bell Prize in 2022 for some simulations they did with Mesh Climate. Finally, I just want to highlight a few non-ECP applications uh, just to show you kind of where the current development is with, with AMRX-based codes. Um, so there's ERF, which is a GPU-capable regional atmospheric modeling code based on the work code that was built on AMRX. Um, ERF is part of the Low Mass Offshore Wind Earthshot project. There's Remora, which is an ocean modeling code based on the existing ROMS model that uses AMRX for performance portability and GPU support. This is part of the SIDAC 5 Seahorse project. Both of these cores, codes use map coordinates to capture flow around uh, terrain. And there's also EXA-EPI, which is an agent-based agent epidemiological modeling code based on EPICAST that, again, relies on AMRX for scaling and GPU support, allowing various transmission scenarios to be quickly projected using uh, like GPU compute resources. So this is a model of kind of two different yeah, transmission scenarios at a California scale simulation, simulation and is tracking like the cases over time. Um, so that kind of is the overview I wanted to give. Uh, and now I will kick it over to Wei Chen Zong, who will give kind of some more details about the mesh functionality available in AMRX. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, let me share a screen. Okay. Trying to move this out of the way. Okay. 